This is Day 8 of Reading Revelation. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. It was given the key for the passage to the abyss. It opened the passage to the abyss, and smoke came up out of the passage like smoke from a huge furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the passage. Locusts came out of the smoke onto the land, and they were given the same power as scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or any tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torment them for five months. The torment they inflicted was like that of a scorpion when it stings a person. During that time, these people will seek death, but will not find it. And they will long to die, but death will escape them. The appearance of the locusts was like that of horses ready for battle. On their heads, they wore what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, and they had hair like women's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had chests like iron breastplates. The sound of their wings was like the sound of many horse-drawn chariots racing into battle. They had tails like scorpions with stingers. With their tails they had power to harm people for five months. They had as their king the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon. The first woe has passed, but there are two more to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the gold altar before God, telling the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the banks of the great river Euphrates. So the four angels were released, who were prepared for this hour, day, month, and year to kill a third of the human race. The number of cavalry troops was 200 million. I heard their number. Now in my vision, this is how I saw the horses and their riders. They wore red, blue, and yellow breastplates, and the horses' heads were like heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. By these three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths, a third of the human race was killed. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like snakes with heads that inflict harm. The rest of the human race who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands to give up the worship of demons and idols made from gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic potions, their unchastity, or their robberies. In this passage, the visions just become wilder and wilder. There's pain and violence and not a whole lot that we can hold on to as being evidence of the mercy and grace of God, it would seem. But I think there are a few messages, some half hidden, some that require more faith, perhaps, that we can take away even from a passage of this sort that otherwise seems to be uh, one mainly of despair. I think one key to understanding what's going on in this passage, what the writer intends, is the presence of chimeras. You may know that in ancient Greek mythology, a chimera was uh, a being that was composed of parts of different animals, part lion, part human, uh, other part snake. There were other parts of, of the chimera that were uh, stuck together. And even today in biology, there are occasions when a uh, at least under experimental conditions, pieces of different animals can be connected, and that's referred to still as a chimera. The thing to see is that this is not natural. This is not the way the world works just by itself. There has to be some intervention to make it happen, and that intervention is usually not what we would think of as being the natural order of things. And so chimeras can never survive there's something about being in a natural state that enables us to survive where if we are somehow grafted onto something that is not normally or naturally or by the will of God part of us, we simply cannot uh, last. So the fact that the chimeras come in these stories 
bringing great violence with them, bringing destruction and death. We should see this. That's not intended to be permanent. These creatures cannot survive, and so the death and destruction that they bring with them will not either. I think it's useful also here to notice the contrast of smoke in this story with the way smoke is used in the form of incense in, in earlier stories. Smoke in earlier stories was understood to be the prayers of the faithful that rise to God as the incense burns. Plainly, that's not the purpose of smoke here. It is a symbol of confusion and obscuring. Perhaps these are prayers that are not offered in faith. These are prayers that are offered for things that are not pure or holy, or perhaps they're the absence of prayer altogether. Notice, though, that there is a driving toward repentance. Those who are bear the brunt of the, the, the calamities in these stories are those who did not repent, did not change their ways. I suppose that means by extension that those who do repent, those who do turn back to the way of God, may find themselves once again in the presence of God. But nonetheless, repentance, we should be very clear, is God's desire, not death. All this killing and smiting and wiping out of, of masses of people is not what God desires is not really the plan of God. God's desire is that everyone should repent. Somehow those who do not, those who are ultimately, who ultimately are lost, are those who have rejected what it is that God offers. Nonetheless, we should not fool ourselves. The writer here is making very clear that pain in the here and now is real. There's no question that there is suffering in the world that we as faithful people should not overlook it or imagine that it's somehow a purifying act of God. I know that in, in a couple of the great disease events of the history of Christianity, the, the plague in the Middle Ages, uh, even the 1918 flu, there were those who said that it was God's visitation on humanity for its sins. God was somehow wiping people out because they were sinful don't think we're supposed to see that. Certainly, I don't think that's the way we're supposed to live our lives. Plainly, we're not supposed to deny aid and comfort to others because we feel that somehow their misfortune, their, their impaired state is a consequence of their sin. And overall, God is still in charge. Through all of this, God is still the one who sits enthroned above it all and God who desires the repentance of sinners. So it's it's critical to balance here. We shouldn't take these, this kind of story too literally. There is much in it that is edifying for us. There's much in it that should tell us something about the world and what we should do, how we should interpret the world and the problems of the world and our role in trying to remediate the problems of the world. But at the same time, we shouldn't over-spiritualize it. This isn't meant to be just a nice fairy tale that we tell before we go back to everything being peace and love and perfection. Somehow there is struggle in the process of coming to faith and remaining faithful. There is struggle in living in a world where there is much power given to things that are not necessarily good for us, things that are not of God. And so to over-spiritualize is to undervalue the struggle that each one of us must go through in order to live a, a righteous life as best we're able. <laughs> ¶¶